Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak with you, um, with my colleagues. Um, you know, happy that you all can, can join this call. Um, it was, a, it was a, sh a shame and unfortunate that the conference had to be canceled and that we couldn't welcome you to New Orleans in person. Um, you know, I will say, since the decision to cancel the conference, uh, or move it online, I should say, things have unfolded quite rapidly uh, in Louisiana and in New Orleans in particular. And uh, at this point, all the bars and restaurants are closed, so uh, you might as well stay out. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, just give a quick update um, of what the outbreak looks like here, uh, how it's unfolded, um, what the steps of mitigation have been, what's going to happen in the future, um, and, uh, and then I'll pause and take any questions and talk about anything else that, that might be pertinent with this pandemic. It, um, it's kind of, kind of an update from the front lines, um, although to be completely honest, it's, it's, it's not me in the front lines, it's, it's really the nurses and docs and MPs that are in the hospital right now that are, that are really on the front lines and, and seeing some things that, that most of them have never seen before. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So the scope of our outbreak, you know, we believe we actually have the fastest growing outbreak in the country in New Orleans right now. Um, by the numbers specifically, the rate of increase is, is comparable uh, to New York and Seattle, a couple other cities. Uh, but we actually have a very long backlog of, of tests that are going to be released um, from the lab, we hope, tonight or tomorrow. Um, that if the numbers hold up to what they've been, um, will be a significant increase to us. So we feel like we have a significant outbreak here. Um, I can't say that people are shocked, um, but it certainly has uh, changed daily life here dramatically, as I know it has in places across the country. We currently have 347 cases across the state. About 88, 89% of those are in the greater New Orleans region. Um, for comparison, we have just shy of 25% of the state's population lives in the greater New Orleans region. We have eight deaths so far across the state. Half of those are in a cluster associated with a uh, independent living and assisted living facility in New Orleans. There's 13 positive cases in that cluster and a couple of um, persons under investigation with tests pending. That's been the most significant cluster that we've had here. The spread through that facility has been rapid and we were able to get resources down from the CDC very quickly um, to go on site and help uh, advise mitigation practices, best strategies. Um, but it's a challenging situation, uh, certainly as we've seen in other congregate living facilities around the country. We, uh, at this point, have very significant community spread in, uh, in New Orleans. Um, unclear to the extent that we have that elsewhere in Louisiana, but um, in New Orleans, there is no question about it. We got our first case in the state here um, about a week and a half ago, last Monday. I mean, case counts have gone up fairly steadily since that time. Uh, we're not aware of a single case in Louisiana that is travel related. Um, they're all, to our understanding right now, community spread. And, and what's more concerning to us um, in the health department is that uh, there's a few clusters, um, but outside of a few clusters of cases, there's just not a lot of relationship between the cases. Uh, there's no, no connection that, that, that we can ascertain. And um, to us, that's indicative of a very high degree of, of virus circulating in the community, a lot of community spread. I, I so, so should apologize at the moment. I'm, I'm remiss. I forgot to introduce myself properly. Um, my name is Dr. Cantor. Uh, I'm the Assistant State Health Officer for the Louisiana Department of Health. I'm also an ER doctor by training, and I, I, I still practice in our safety net ER. We, um, we are proceeding along uh, basically a, a three-pronged strategy at the moment. Um, we're trying to identify cases. We're trying to uh, prevent person-to-person -person spread, and we're trying to um, prepare for a, a very significant hospital surge need. That, that will undoubtedly come. So I'll talk a little bit about each of those three priorities. 
Identifying cases has been challenging for us. We have a shortage of testing equipment, and uh, I don't think it's any different than most places in the country, but it's significant and it's frustrating um, because it's not a resource that we're at the moment able to produce on our own. We're reliant on supply chains that run throughout the country um, and abroad. We're reliant on the federal government uh, to help make the supply chains available, and we're reliant on private companies. Um, and uh, it puts us at a disadvantaged situation. You know, the testing equipment actually uh, is, is a number of different parts to it. And, and I'll tell you, over the past couple weeks, um, you know, every day we're short of a different part of that. So, you know, just going from upstream to downstream, you've got the actual swab uh, that you use to collect the sample, which which um, is basically the same swab you use to do a flu test. Um, you have the viral transport media that the swab goes into after it's been swabbed. That's the, you can use the same stuff that, that you use for a flu test for that as well. Um, once it gets to the lab, you have an extraction kit, you have reagents, and then you have the actual testing kit itself. And these are the testing kits that initially were just coming from the CDC, um, and now there's, there's private labs that are making them as well. But each of those is a separate entity. It each has its own supply chain. And uh, you know, I'll tell you, one day we'll be short just statewide on one of those, and the next day it'll be the next. And uh, it's been a real challenge for both us in our state lab, um, in the private labs, and just you know, in the care sites and hospitals and clinics across the state to, to keep good supply of that. So you know, we feel that that's likely one of the reasons why we had such a high uh, level of diagnosed community spread so quickly. It was just a lot of virus circulating, and the testing capacity, unfortunately, wasn't there to lay eyes on that. Um, we feel like it's getting better, but it's certainly nowhere uh, close to where it needs to be. The criteria um, that patients need to meet to get tested right now, you know, to, to be honest with, with you, it's, it's a moving target, and it really is dependent on the availability of tests. This time a week ago or so, we were following the CDC's rather strict guidance, and the CDC eventually opened it up to uh, essentially clinician discretion. Um, but that was so much, somewhat of an empty promise because uh, you know, if you didn't have tests available to you, then there was no cl clinical discretion. Um, the way that we have divided up here, we have a, a state lab run by our office of public health that can run the test, that's in Baton Rouge. And then providers obviously have relationships with the commercial labs, um, LabCorp, Quest, Abbott, and so forth. The real difference from a provider point of view is our state lab is getting results back in 24 to 48 hours, and the private labs are taking four or five days. So we have devised a scheme where uh, inpatients, ICU patients, patients who are homeless, and uh, anyone that we think might be associated with a cluster, something of uh, public health concern, and nursing home patients are all going to the state lab. Anyone who's ambulatory, in, either in a clinic or um, in an ER, but expected to be discharged, we're asking folks to send those tests to the private labs. And um, you know, the reason we're doing that is, is just strictly for two reasons. Uh, one, um, anything involving a healthcare worker exposure, we want to get the results back quickly uh, and, and, and get that person off the bench and, and back, back at work. Same thing goes um, for these high-risk settings like homeless shelters and, and nursing homes. And then the other reason we're doing that is um, anyone who's inpatient, whether on a floor or an ICU, uh, just waiting for the test result to come back, you know, the, the care teams providing care to that patient are just burning through PPE right now, masks, gloves, gowns, just using a ton of it. And we're just as limited with PPE as we are with tests. So, so anyone that's certainly high risk and anyone that's causing the care team to go through a lot of PPE devices, we prioritize to get those results back quick. Everyone else, you know, the ambulatory population, um, you know, they'll typically get, get discharged home and they'll be counseled uh, to isolate themselves and await the test results, um, you know, which essentially is not different than the counseling done when there's clinical suspicion for the disease but no test available. The admission criteria here doesn't change at all. The admission criteria remains clinical admission criteria. The only thing that changes is the precautions that person has to take and those around them. So in situations where a clinician 
suspects the virus but doesn't have the test available to them, the best practice is to send that individual home with the same counseling you would give them if they were known to be positive. And that would be um, to isolate at home until either you can get two negative tests separated by 24 hours, which is hard to do when there's no test around, uh, or the second best way to do it is um, resolution three days after resolution of symptoms or seven days after the onset of symptoms, whichever of those two is greater. The second strategy that we're working towards is um, preventing the spread of the virus person to person via social distancing measures. And you know, we've been fortunate that Mayor of New Orleans, Parish President of Jefferson Parish, which is the, the surrounding county outside of New Orleans, and go our governor, Governor Edwards, um, have been incredibly responsive and proactive on this and essentially listened uh, to us in the health department, asked what they should be doing, and um, have not had any pushback on a political level. They've, we've felt comfortable that they, they've taken some bold steps and, and um, you know, have no problem taking flack for that. So at this point, K-12 schools are closed throughout the state. They'll be closed um, through April 13. Falls restaurants are largely closed. Um, they can do takeout, for example, but you can't congregate in their public gatherings. Larger than 50 individuals are banned. Uh, these very similar measures that um, even a number of states are taking. I've been impressed um, with the level of cooperation folks in the public have have shown. We were bracing for a lot of pushback, um, uh, but you know, we, there's been a little bit, but it hasn't been that bad. I, I, my sense is that people really recognize that that we're in something serious here, and uh, have been have been fairly willing to comply. So we feel like we're getting good cooperation from the public. Um, the message that we try and push now is one of personal responsibility. And a lot of these social distancing measures are hard to police. Um, you really can't enforce a lot of them. Certainly can enforce, you know, people having dinner parties and, and all those sorts of things. So personal responsibility has, has a big role to play here, and that's one of the public messages that we're trying to get across right now. And the third aspect is um, preparing for a real drastic surge in, in inpatient hospital need. We, um, one of the benefits of, of being in Louisiana is we do a lot of emergency preparedness, um, hurricanes and so forth. So from that regard, we have a pretty good system down and, and, some, and some good um, lines of communication. So we get daily counts from every hospital in the state, um, inpatient bed capacity, ICU capacity, ventilator capacity, uh, and now we're asking for negative pressure rooms as well. So at the moment, we're looking okay. I can tell you statewide, uh, we've got about 38% of hospital beds open and available. In the New Orleans region, that goes down a little bit to 33%. Statewide, we've got 80% of ventilators currently unused. Um, and a good amount of negative pressure rooms are still, still available. Uh, we're getting 200 additional ventilators sent into the state um, any day now, today, tomorrow. So capacity at the moment is fine, but, but we certainly know what's coming. So what we've done towards that end, we have directed uh, from the state health office uh, every hospital to postpone by 30 days any outpatient or ambulatory visit or procedure that can safely be postponed 30 days, essentially uh, directing hospitals to, to cancel electric procedures and visits. We have directed all dental offices to cancel non-essential dental visits and, and procedures for the next 30 days. There's really two reasons for that. Um, they use a lot of PPE in those, and um, a dental visit is actually quite high risk for transmission um, up in someone's oral cavity and with the air and, and, and the water that they use for that. Uh, we've directed hospitals to, to prepare their surge plans. A, a number of hospitals here are, are built out specifically with surge capability in mind. Um, for example, uh, every single room in many of the hospitals here can be easily turned into a double. And in some of the newer hospitals, the, the large conference centers, um, like on the first floor, for example, are, are piped out to be appropriate for patient care. Uh, they can line it with cots if they need to. So we have directed hospitals to, to begin preparations for that. We think that'll give us um, a good amount of surge. The next step after that would be for us to erect uh, military-style mash tents in the parking lots, which we're certainly prepared to do. 
and you know, we're also cognizant that we're running up against the beginning of hurricane season, so that's on our mind. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, um, I don't want to say unexpected, but, but challenges that have come up along the way for us. Uh, the first is mental health. Um, this has been a really stressful event, uh, and we're just in it for everyone involved. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, for the public, uh, it's really hard for, for people, and, and, and you, you couple the fear with, with an outbreak like this with the economic challenges that are, that are happening, and, and it's, it's really difficult for people. Um, it, it makes very challenging situations. Uh, we've stood up in our health department, a 24-hour um, behavioral health counseling line for, for anyone that, that, that wants to talk it out and get some resources through, through that, and we've gotten um, some good uh, response rates out of that. But um, yeah, I recognize that it's, it's very, very challenging time for folks uh, mentally in this situation. I do want to mention um, mental health of healthcare workers. I, you know, I can't say I've ever seen uh, this amount of fear uh, amongst my colleagues here. I spent some time walking through the hospital the other night, and uh, there's a real palpable sense of, of fear. You know, about a third of our ER beds right now are, are filled with patients who are either positive or pending tests. Probably half the ER staff is, is wearing PPE. Um, we've got hospital staff furloughed because uh, they need to be quarantined. We've got hospital um, healthcare associated infection professionals constantly loosening the criteria of what type of PPE and what protection guidelines are appropriate, purely out of necessity because we were running short, but it's not reassuring for frontline clinicians. Now, all that's to say, um, you know, we are worried that our clinicians are going to burn out. Um, it's it's going to be hard. They're going to be tired. We're working hard to message that this is going to be a, this is not a, a quick two week thing here. We're, we're in this. I mean, two or three months maybe. Uh, it's going to be a long haul, and we need people to take care of themselves and, and practice self care. That, that, that's a message that we're slowly realizing we have to do more to push out. Some of the other challenges that we've had, um, PPE is, is certainly certainly a challenge. Uh, we have nursing homes that are that are running real low while trying to manage um, some quarantine or isolation issues there. Um, that's, that's not good. And um, we're struggling hard to get more PPE. We have some coming today. We're going to get some more tomorrow. But um, it's tough because it's, uh, it's not good for the frontline healthcare workers to have to worry about whether the PPE is going to be there when they show up to shift tomorrow. Um, we've realized that we have a lot of patients that have challenging dispositions and we had to make accommodations for them. So um, we had some folks who were either under investigation with a test pending or known positive, a test came back, who could not go back to their former living situation for one reason or another. Not sick enough to be admitted, so clinically it could be ambulatory, but we're either experiencing homelessness and couldn't send them back to a shelter. Uh, or we're living, for example, with you know a family or, or grandparents, and the family didn't have the resources to to acquire other temporary accommodation, and we certainly couldn't send these folks back to those type of homes. So we have stood up some temporary um, uh, residency or, or, or sheltering operations. Uh, we essentially took over a state park just outside of New Orleans that has some cabins. We brought in about 90 uh, trailer home type units and we're setting up um, an Army-style tent barrack operation now. So we'll have capacity for about 333 individuals there, uh, likely in the next two or three days. There's about 20 people there currently. Two other of these sites are being stood up around the state, and, uh, and this is where we will let people go um, who don't have good options because currently they're just sitting in the ER or in inpatient floors, um, for no other reason than they can't appropriately be discharged. And while they're there, they're taking up healthcare resources, burning through PPE, um, causing a lot of problems. Uh, the other issue that we've had so far is you know, we've had to grapple with how aggressive we're going to get with isolation and then quarantine orders. You know, majority of people, 80, 85% or so of COVID positive patients um, are going to have mild symptoms, if any, they're going to be at home. Um, and they're going to be instructed to isolate, and, and, and that's usually not going to be under threat of force. They're usually going to be isolating on their own, 
um, on their own honor, so to say. There's just not enough police officers to do anything different. Um, now, on the other hand, we have some patients who uh, indicate to their care teams that they that they do not intend to isolate. And patient, uh, we get calls all the time from patients that are uh, wanting to leave the hospital or, or being set up for discharge and, and get counseled on what isolation should be and, and basically say, no, I'm not going to do that. And the hospital is in a real bind. Do they stop the individual from leaving? Do they treat that individual just like they would treat, um, for example, a patient who said they were going to go shoot someone? Um, we fought that way for Ebola, but this is certainly, uh, you know, Ebola was 60 to 70 percent fatal. This is somewhere between 0.9 and 2 percent maybe fatal. So it's a different thought process. We're working through that now. What we're probably going to do is write some standing isolation quarantine orders, uh, blanket orders that hospital uh, lawyers can have on hand so they can kind of um, have what they need to, to make those decisions quickly um, on their own. You know, I will say, um, you know, I'm cognizant that I'm speaking to a group of, of family family docs right now. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that, that, that your patients are going to be facing uh, that's not strictly medical <laughs> coming up that, that I, think, I think you might have a large role in, in grappling with and, and helping them through. Um, you know, certainly any type of routine medical care is going to be disrupted. A lot of ambulatory visits are going to be disrupted. Routine health screenings are going to be disrupted. Nobody in New Orleans is going to get a screening colonoscopy for the next couple of months, for example. Those sorts of things are, are not good. They have real consequences, and it's going to be hard to ensure that once this is over, patients get what they need, that they get back on track. And then families are going to face a real disruption in education for their kids out of school for a while, certainly economic ramifications. Um, it's going to be really tough for families, and I think... I think you will be in a unique place to help families through that, and I'd like you to be thinking about how you might best do that. With that, uh, I already talked a little bit longer than I thought I would, so I'll pause there. I'm certainly happy to chat on any questions that folks might have. Hi, Dr. Kander. Thank you so much. Um, and as you can imagine, there are probably a, there are a lot of questions our, our audience has. So I'm going to work through them, but uh, let me know on your uh, the timing if you end up in a situation where you need to go. Just let me know, and we'll, we'll definitely cut short or work on your time. Uh, the first question uh, it says it's asking the sensitivity specificity of COVID-19 testing. Specifically, um, I have NICU, PQ staff, and other healthcare workers, including their bosses, HR, clearing to return to work based on negative testing results. I still recommend they stay isolated until at least 48 hours after symptom-free without medications. Sure, that's a great question, um, and you know it's, it's new, so we're learning a lot about it. Uh, you know, we believe the test itself is highly specific. Uh, it's it's an RT PCR. Um, if it's showing if it's showing RNA, then then you can be pretty sure that there's RNA there. So so we believe that it's very specific. The sensitivity it varies a lot depending on the type of sample you get. It's it's a you know, typically a nasal or an oral pharyngeal swab. And if you don't get a good swab, then you're not going to have good sensitivity. And the sensitivity also goes up uh, the more a patient is symptomatic, the more that they're viremic, the more that they have secretions to swab. So if you're catching someone at the very early stages of their clinical progression um, and you don't get a good swab, you know, it's not going to be terribly sensitive. So having an, and it's certainly not going to be sensitive in asymptomatic people. And we're really trying at this point, with the limited test that we have, we're really trying to avoid using it on, on asymptomatic people, um, despite some very vocal calls to do so. So uh, I think the precautions you mentioned are are, are pretty common sense. I'll, I'll tell you, a, a week ago, we had um, you know, routinely healthcare workers who had an exposure would be quarantined for 14 days, and within two days of that we realized that we couldn't do it. There are just not enough healthcare workers, hospitals. We had one hospital that had a 30% absenteeism rate after we did that. So we had to work with the CDC and do modified guidelines. And now after an exposure, clinicians are still there. They're wearing a mask and they're checking their temperature twice a day. So you'd have to do what you, you can do to continue to provide services. Excellent, thank you. 
Got another one is, uh, what is your recommendation for ambulatory outpatient visits, uh, wellness visits, routine med refills, well child visits, specifically infants and immunizations? Sure. Um, you know, I'm going to repeat the question because it was a little bit un it was choppy in mind. And so the question was recommendation for uh, ambulatory visits, well visits, those sorts of things. Well, I think you have to look at it from, from two sides. You have to look at it from a resource utilization point of view. Um, is it worth your resources to do, do that, or would your resources be better sent elsewhere? I'll tell you right now in this community, um, we don't need the resources at the moment, but two weeks from now, I think we will. Two weeks from now, I think we will be asking, for example, primary care physicians if they would help us um, in the inpatient floors if, if, if the need arises. And we've broadcasted that need, that potential need, um, you know, to, to hospital leaders and, and to the medical community. Hopefully, we don't get that to that because it's not going to be ideal for anyone, certainly not for a physician who hasn't practiced acute care in, in quite some time. Um, but but that, that, that might be a need. So you have to look at it from a, first from a resource standpoint. Does it make sense to continue expanding that resource on a systems level? If the answer is yes, well, then you want to minimize the risk as best as possible. Um, so you want to um, segregate your sick and not sick population as best you can, as much as you can do on the medicine, phone calls, telemedicine, the better. And, and, and we're really asking providers here to expand what they feel comfortable with dealing on the phone because uh, everything in medicine is a risk benefit and now you need to add a lot more risk to your clinical encounter, risk of bringing somebody in, exposing that person to other people, other patients, exposing, exposing them to you and to your team, all that adds risk. So perhaps you might feel comfortable doing more over the phone than you would be under normal times. Uh, Frequent washing, wiping down, disinfecting of the high-touch surfaces in your clinic, doorknobs, handrails, countertops, desks. Um, and uh, you know, we would certainly recommend twice daily temperature checks for all, all for you and for your team. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another one is, what is your opinion on the reports of hydro hydroxychloroquine as treatment for COVID-19? Well, I'll tell you... Um, a number of our ID services here are doing it. Um, and the data is, I mean, we'll see what the, what the data is. You know, I've seen some encouraging case reports. Um, you know, likely not going to get an RCT on this anytime soon. Um, but um, the ID docs here seem, seem to think it's, it, it's worthwhile. Um, it's certainly, certainly not harmful. So um, they've been doing it. Um, we've had a few cases of uh, compassionate use from Desivir uh, been approved. Those approval approvals go through Gilead itself. And I think Gilead has a web portal to, to allow for that. And then Gilead will interface with the FDA. They're, they're casting a really narrow net on this. You have to be, um, <laughs> you have to be really sick, but not too sick. You get, they want people who are intubated, but not yet in renal failure and not yet <laughs> in, 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 in extremis. So it's, it's not a lot of patients. I think we've had one or two in the area approved for remdesivir. But, you know, um, we'll, we'll see. You know, we're keeping a close watch on what the NIH is saying about this. Um, the interesting thing is there's been different practices evolved. We have two different academic systems here. We've got LSU and Tulane. And, um, you know, everyone has their own practice, um, kind of unofficial protocols right now. So I think you'll see those coalescing to um, – to more standardized protocols as data becomes available, but the CDC will tell you now that there's just not a lot of data to go on. Thanks. Uh, another question, uh, as a resident who moves from inpatient to outpatient duties, do you have any recommendations about how we handle resident work duties? Should we set aside a set of residents who work inpatient, set aside who work outpatient? That's a great question. Um, it's been challenging from a graduate medical education point of view and I'll talk about medical students as well. There's concerns that they might not be getting the educational experience they need to uh, matriculate to the next step. We made the directive in New Orleans that we do not want medical students or residents, if possible, to be directly involved in the care of COVID positive patients for the only reason that we are desperately trying to preserve PPE. 
if you don't need three people to go into a patient's room, then don't do that. We're really sh short on PPE, and so we're, we're trying to preserve that. Now, that said, um, we are anticipating a surge in inpatient need. We've pulled back. Um, I'm speaking, for example, on behalf of our uh, emergency medicine residency program, which is what I'm most familiar with. We've pulled back our residents from all non-essential rotations, all electives. We've pulled them back. We've pulled back a couple of vacations. And we've, we've stationed them in our main hospital and told them, get ready, essentially. So I don't have specific recommendations for what you do between the inpatient and the outpatient, other than I think your residents need to be prepared to provide acute care if and when the time arises. Thank you. Um, another question, is the recommendation to test if symptoms are present and another diagnosis is made, such as influenza or pneumonia? Can people be co-infected with another process and COVID-19? Oh, absolutely. And it's an imperfect recommendation, but you know, we are at a state right now where we are, I mean, I'm hesitant to say rationing, but we are trying to do the greatest good with a very limited uh, set of resources. So we, at this moment, we only have so many tests, and it is certainly possible to be co-infected with influenza and COVID, 100%. The odds of it are less. You're more likely if you're sick to have one or the other. So, you know, um, that's one aspect. The other aspect of it is uh, we don't necessarily want people to be using up a flu swab and the viral transport media if they don't have to. And it's a challenging situation because there's two ways to look at it. You could look at it from one point of view, which is I need this swab and this transport media to test for COVID, so I'm going to save it for that. And you look at it from the other point of view, which is, well, wait a minute, influenza, if it's caught early, is a treatable disease, so I should, I should test for it. Um, and those are tough decisions. Um, and at the moment, um, you know, we're, we're relying on, on clinicians to make those. We're, we're not dictating one course or the other. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another one is asking for just, I guess, any general comments on the risk of transmission in an asymptomatic patient? Well, this is a moving target. And, and I'll tell you, uh, about a month ago or so, um, you know, folks at the CDC were saying there is no asymptomatic transmission. And then you, you see the number of case reports come out that, that suggest it's likely possible. Um, and, and the CDC ha has come around to indicating it as much. You know, the best thought that, that we've been privy to at the moment is it's likely possible, but it's not driving the epidemic. Um, so the counseling should be appropriate as such, um, but what's driving the epidemic is symptomatic individuals coming in close contact with, with other, other individuals. Which, to that end, the biggest talking point uh, from a from a public education standpoint that we are trying to put out above all else is if you're feeling sick, stay home. I mean, of course, we're still in the middle of flu season and that's good advice anyway, but you know, in the context of limited testing supply, we feel that that, that is the one public health message that needs to be above all else right now. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, as you can imagine, we, we have a ton of questions. This is obviously the, the biggest thing going on right now. Um, so if, if you do, uh, we're, we're past the 30 minute mark. So I, I, I'm going to keep going, but uh, if that's okay with you, but again, if, if you need to leave, we have another presentation that starts at, at two o'clock, but I'm not saying you have to stay sure. your entire time. I've, but, got time for, uh, I've got time for maybe two or three more questions. If that's okay. Two, three. Okay, perfect. Excellent. All right. So this next one is kind of a combo of, of two questions. First one asks, uh, any thoughts on early insights from France about ACE, ARB meds, and NSAIDs? And then a secondary one says, can you speak on why they wouldn't be recommended? Yeah, there, there's a lot of talk on that. Um, I can't speak too well on the pharmacodynamics of it, um, but there, there, there's a lot of talk about whether they're significant. And I'll tell you, we have, we have heard uh, both, particularly for NSAIDs, we've heard both cases that they're 100% to be avoided and, and that, 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 that recommendation is overblown. Um, um, we've not been recommending giving NSAIDs to people just because we don't know the answer. So uh, we're using acetaminophen. But um, you know, beyond that, I think, listen, over the next couple of weeks, um, you know, as, as a medical community, we're going to find out a lot more about this. There are so many things we don't know. Why are kids doing fine? Um, they certainly seem to be vectors, but, but why are, by and large, 
kids doing very well? We really don't know. And you really hope that the answers to those might, might help direct some, some, some therapies for this. Excellent, thanks. Um, we've got another question. What's considered symptom-free? Is it fever-free, cough-free? Some viral illnesses, we uh, see cough linger for weeks. Do we, uh, do we know if this is the case with COVID-19? We are considering, for Louisiana, we are considering symptom-free to be 100% symptom-free. A febrile, no cough, no malaise, no shortness of breath. Um, now, it's tough because, you know, spring allergies are, are coming up now and, and, and we're still in flu season and we recognize that people might be in isolation for longer than necessary. But at this stage in the, in, in the outbreak when there's a lot more unknowns than there are unknowns and the testing supply is limited, we feel it's prudent to be conservative. You know, I would expect, you know, a few weeks into this now, I mean, a, a few more weeks down the road, I should say, as the testing supply increases, it'll become more practical to swab someone again, see it, make sure that they are now negative, do that again 24 hours later, and then you can say that they're good to go. Um, that's what the CDC says is, is the gold standard. You know, we are not able to do that now at all because of the testing supply, but, but hopefully, you know, a little bit down the road, that'll be a more precise way to, to let patients know, okay, you've recovered. We no longer think you're infectious. You're free to, to leave isolation. Uh, maybe one more question, if that's okay. Sure, definitely, thanks. And uh, we, you know, we do have a few others. What I might do is, is just send to you, and obviously no, no expectation on tonight, but uh, maybe over the course of the next week or so, if we can get uh, maybe some follow-ups, if, if you see anything that jumps out there that you think is really uh, important sure. for our, our, our family docs to know about. Okay, excellent. Sure. All right, so this, uh, this last one we'll, I'll let you go on is, uh, how do you feel about CDC changing the guidelines on PPE and 95 recommendation changed uh, to surgical masks to the shortage? Uh, staff are being asked to use masks for one to two weeks. Any strategy to keep these limited masks functional longer using a surgical mask or N95? Well, I think they're doing what they have to do. Um, you know, I'll tell you, if they didn't make that recommendation, there, were, there would be um, some, some, some care providers and clinics and hospitals here that would have to shut down for a day or two until they got resupplied. So I, I think those recommendations are pragmatic. I think they're being, they're being based on the best information that the CDC has available to it. Um, I think they are um, cognizant of the real challenges that, that, that the clinicians on the front lines and those hospitals or clinic systems supporting them are, are facing. It would not be realistic at this point for the CDC to say you have to follow gold standard PPE or nothing else um, because then uh, we would severely lim limit life-saving care. At this point, certainly in New Orleans we would. So uh, I, I think it's, um, it's unfortunate pragmatism um, on their part. Now, I'll tell you, it's, it's a source of stress for our frontline clinicians. It's not, it's not confidence inspiring to have someone tell you the recommendations of how you were to keep yourself safe two weeks ago. Uh, you can actually do half of that, or you can change it. Um, and, and I think that's causing a lot of fear in, in our colleagues who are on the front lines. And, and um, you know, it, it is what it is, but, but I think we've got to recognize that. And I think we've got to be thinking of ways to support our colleagues in this because it, it is going to be quite the long haul. Um, listen, it, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. Again, I, I'm remiss that we didn't get the chance to host you in person. We love hosting visitors in New Orleans. It's what we do best. Uh, please come back and see us next year. Um, you know, New Orleans is a great place to visit. I, I hope we do get to see you, see you sometime down the road. Well, thank you all. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Cantor. And uh, you know, on, on behalf of all ACOFP and then especially my, my board president just reached out, really wanted to thank you as well. Dr. Luca uh, sends his thanks uh, from him and the entire board. So thank you for taking your time. I know you got a lot going on, so really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. All right, for everyone else, just to let you know, we will have another presentation starting at uh, 2 o'clock Central. Um, so uh, we're going to take a short, uh, about 15, 20 minute uh, stand and stretch until the next presentation. And like I said, I will uh, work to follow up with Dr. Cantor on those questions. We had about 20 unanswered and I can imagine uh, everybody wanted a lot of answers on that stuff. So I will definitely reach out and, and get the answers as quickly as I can. Thank you so much. We'll be talking soon.